Hello, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Tom Diggins. Over the years, I've become fascinated with Sloat's Landing, or what I think of as the events of July 7, 1846, when at the beginning of the war with Mexico, Commodore John Drake Sloat launched an amphibious attack against the capital of Mexican California. He raised the Stars and Stripes over the Monterey Custom House and proclaimed Mexican California for the United States of America. I think that Sloat deserves a lot more recognition, and I think that Sloat's landing is probably the most forgotten significant event in American history. So when I learned that the Carmel Foundation not only was aware of the event, but was going to recognize the 175th anniversary, I was very pleased and surprised, and I was very excited when they asked me to, to do this presentation. So thank you, Carmel Foundation and members. I've never done a presentation quite like this, so let's see how it goes. Let's start with the United States in 1840. The country has gone through a huge westward expansion. Big wave of immigrants from Europe are pushing further and further west up to the Mississippi River and now over the Mississippi River. The country has a nationalist fervor and we've come to believe in a policy called manifest destiny. And what manifest destiny meant was, because we are Americans, God wants us to expand across the entire continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific. However, when we look westward, we do face a few obstacles. Number one, the Oregon Territory. Oregon, Washington, uh, parts of Idaho and Montana, and all of British Columbia is in dispute with England over where the border with Canada should be. We want the border way up north near Alaska, the English want it on the Columbia River. We agree to disagree and we have joint occupancy there. Many people think that Oregon may become an independent country of its own. Texas has begun its secession and independence from Mexico and we have Mexican California. Mexican California stretches a thousand miles from the Pacific Ocean across Nevada, across Utah into Colorado and Wyoming and across Arizona to New Mexico. So one of the things that we're looking at is possible uh, conflict with Mexico, who's not too happy, particularly uh, with the Texans at this time. So that's the political situation in the world when Commodore John Drake Sloat is given command of the American Pacific Squadron. Sloat's aware of all the political and geopolitical ramifications with England and Mexico when he leaves the United States in September of 1844. He arrives in Chile on station in January of 1845. Now when Sloat left the United States, they hadn't even had the election of 1844 yet, so Sloat has no idea who the president is. And in March of 1845, President Polk is inaugurated. Polk is an expansionist president. He's promising manifest destiny. And Texas is admitted as a state. So this really ratchets up the tension with Mexico. And in fact, uh, Sloat's new boss, the Navy Secretary George Bancroft, sends a letter to Sloat warning of impending war with Mexico. In June of 1845, Bancroft follows up by sending orders to Sloat. In July, Sloat receives the first letter, and in November of 1845, Sloat receives Bancroft's orders. So you can see the disadvantage that Sloat is under. He's been on station for 11 months, and he's just now getting his orders. And Bancroft's orders say that Mexico's ports are reported to be open and defenseless. Don't be aggressive, don't cause an international incident, but if you ascertain beyond a doubt, if you ascertain with certainty that Mexico has declared war on the United States, then seize the ports. And by the way, don't upset the inhabitants. One month later in December of 1845, John C. Fremont arrives in California. Now Fremont is the first white man to cross the Sierras in the wintertime. They said it couldn't be done but he did it, and he did it dragging a cannon. And we will see how Fremont's actions affected Sloat's thinking and his actions. 
As an aside on Fremont, I think he's a great American hero. In 1842 and 1844, he led two great expeditions to map and explore the West as part of the U.S. topographical core. When Fremont returns, Congress publishes his journals and drawings, and the country goes wild, amazed by the promise of the West. Fremont becomes a national hero, the Pathfinder. Fremont meets and marries Jesse Hart Benton, the daughter of a powerful expansionist Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. And now Fremont receives new orders to explore the Arkansas River and the Red River Valleys. He meets with Benton and Polk. What was Fremont told? We don't know because there's no minutes, there's no notes, there's no journal of those meetings. All we have is what Fremont says he was told. But the question is now, what is Fremont doing in California? Jumping ahead just a little bit, uh, Sloat makes Fremont the military governor of California. Fremont bickers with Kearney in 1847. Kearney wants to be military governor and Fremont won't let him. So General Kearney brings charges against Colonel Fremont for mutiny and failure to obey the orders of a superior officer. Fremont is sent to Washington, D.C., where he's tried before the Senate of the United States, and he's found guilty of all the charges. But President Polk pardons him because he's the Pathfinder. Fremont is one of our first two senators when we become a state. He's the first Republican candidate for President of the United States in 1856. And he's appointed by Lincoln as the military governor of Missouri at the beginning of the Civil War, and Fremont frees all the slaves, which annoys Lincoln because it would take two more years for him to write the Emancipation Proclamation. And late in his life, Fremont was the territorial governor of Arizona. But that's all in the future. But he is indeed a great American character in history. So things really start to pick up now as we get into 1846. Sloat is aware of the political turmoil in Mexico and California. There's three powerful strong men who are vying for power in Mexico. One's in power, then the other comes in. So a lot of uh, things going on there, a lot of turmoil. Sloat is keeping track of the British Navy and the situation in the Oregon Territory. Now, we don't know that Polk is negotiating with the English uh, as this is going on, but the Oregon Territory is settled uh, by mid-1846 by just extending the 49th parallel uh, further westward, uh, the border with Canada where it is the rest of the country. But also in 1846 now, a secret courier, Special Agent Marine Lieutenant Archibald Gillespie, arrives with new orders for Sloat, for Thomas Larkin, and for Fremont. Well, again, the question arises, how does Gillespie know that Fremont's in California? He's supposed to be in the Red River Valley. Now, Thomas Larkin is the American consul in Monterey. He's named as the confidential agent to President Polk. He's got a direct pipeline to the White House. Larkin is directed to encourage California independence from Mexico or neutrality. Uh, again, people are thinking that they may become an independent country and to counter any efforts by foreign governments, i.e. England, to control California. Sloat was ordered to deploy his entire force in the event of actual hostilities with Mexico, something different from his previous orders ascertained beyond a doubt. Sloat sends Gillespie on the Cyan to Monterey to give Larkin his orders and to look for Fremont in the Central Valley. How does Gillespie know where to look? In March of 1846, things are getting a little crazy. Fremont had told the Mexican officials that he's in California to survey the Klamath Valley to look for a better way to Oregon. But that's not what he's doing. He's riding around California, creating mischief everywhere, and he rides up to the top of San, uh, to Gabalan Peak, and he spies on General Castro and his troops down in San Juan Batista. Castro orders Fremont to leave California, and Fremont begins uh, heading back north. Larkin is so concerned about the tension that he requests an American warship and Sloat sends the Port Portsmouth to Monterey. The Cyan arrives on April 17th with Gillespie. Gillespie leaves to find Fremont. The Portsmouth arrives a week later, April 23rd. 
Larkin is concerned that Fremont is about to cause a major incident with Mexico. In May of 1846, President Polk sends Zachary Taylor and 10,000 troops to the Rio Grande and they provoke the Mexican army. The battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma occur on the Rio Grande and war against Mexico is declared. Yay! Sloat receives a secret message on May 17th from an American official who is returning to Washington and he notifies Sloat of the two battles. Sloat sends the Cyan back to Monterey on May 19th to let Larkin know that this could be the beginning of the war. In June of 1846, lacking clear intelligence, Sloat is cautious and unsure what to do. He departs Mazalan on June 1st, but returns on June 5th, still in doubt. After receiving confirmation of the battles and the blockade of Veracruz on June 7th, Sloat sails from Mazalan on June 9th, approximately three weeks after learning of the battles. On June 14th, 30 men in Sonoma attacked the Presidio capture General Mariano Vallejo and raise the bear flag. Fremont begins to assemble an army to fight General Castro in Monterey. Now Bancroft had ordered friendly and conciliatory relations. Polk wanted a peaceful annexation. Fremont is really muddying the waters and making things much more complicated. July 2nd, Sloat arrives in Monterey. He meets with Larkin. The Cyan and the Levant are already in Monterey. On June 3rd, Sloat gives his men shore leave. On July 4th, they ho host a 4th of July party on board the ships. July 5th and 6th, Sloat is still wavering. Presumably, he has determined the status and disposition of the Mexican forces, and also, presumably, is still weighing his options. One story says that Purser Rodman Price of the Levant called on Sloat aboard the Savannah, stating that he knew President Polk and knew what Polk would want. Price urged Sloat to attack immediately. Another story says Captain Mervine of the Cyan risked his commission by berating Sloat for his inaction. Or perhaps Sloat finally had his plan in place. In any event, Sloat sends dispatches to the Cyan and the Levant in Monterey and to the Portsmouth in San Francisco. I have decided to hoist the flag of the United States at this place tomorrow and orders Montgomery to raise the flag in San Francisco and Sonoma. On July 7th, 9 a.m., Captain Mervine goes ashore with a formal demand for surrender. Captain Silva states he has no authority and no troops nor any arms to surrender. No Mexican flag is flying at the custom house or at the fort. Mervine searches the town to find a flag to use during the surrender ceremony. Mervine returns to the Savannah to report to Sloat. At 10 o'clock, Sloat orders Mervine to lead 250 sailors and Marines in an amphibious landing at the custom house in Monterey. Military positions are established on the beach, on the hill, and elsewhere. A Mexican flag was first raised, then lowered in surrender. A 28-star U.S. flag was raised to the cheers of the crowd. Each ship fired a 21-gun salute. And Sloat's proclamation to the inhabitants of California was read by Purser Price from the balcony of the Custom House. Sloat's proclamation said, a state of war existing between our two nations, I am invading. But even though I come with a powerful force, I come as your best friend. You are now all American citizens with all rights and privileges. If you don't wish to be an American citizen, you are free to leave. But we will have all the same laws and all the same property rights. But as Americans, you will no longer have to pay taxes on the imported American goods and your property will appreciate. Too much cheering on the part of the residents of Monterey. So what happens next? Well, Company of Dragoon, Dragoons was formed to scout the surrounding area for Mexican forces. Salute orders the Portsmouth to Yerba Buena, where the flag is raised in Sonoma and San Francisco. 
The U.S. flag is also raised in San Jose and Sutter's Fork. So within five days, Sloat has pretty much captured Northern California without a shot being fired. Sloat departs Monterey in August. He's replaced by Commodore Stockton. There are some skirmishes in Southern California, but the war with Mexico is primarily fought in Mexico, the halls of Montezuma and so forth, and it ends in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which settles the border dispute between Texas and Mexico and gives us by treaty all of that territory captured by Slope militarily, 600,000 square miles of Mexican California. So why isn't Sloat a national hero? Why isn't Sloat's landing more famous? Historians have just not been kind to Sloat, citing his reluctance to act. Why did he wait 17 days after first hearing about the battles? Uh, why did he wait five days in Monterey before launching his attack? And one thing that doesn't help him, Sloat was 65 years old. He was very tired after 40 years at sea. He had asked to be relieved and was waiting for the arrival of Commodore Stockton. So not the most eager participant. But I'm a little more forgiving. I think Sloat carefully deliberated before making a very big call, and it was all his. He had no one else he could talk to. Sloat's orders were clear in intent, but vague on specifics. Sloat's orders were confusing. Ascertain with certainty and beyond doubt is not the same as in the event of actual hostilities. And Slow was unsure of Fremont's orders and activities. What is the Army up to that the Navy doesn't know? Sloat had been getting regular intelligence reports from the Cyan and the Portsmouth, as well as from Larkin, on the situation in Monterey and California. So he's very much aware of what's happening. He did second guess himself and made a false start, but corrected and received after receiving confirmation of the battles. Now, there's a myth about Sloat and the English. The English Navy was in the Pacific to protect English shipping and trade. They had no designs on Mexican California, although they were hoping for neutrality rather than a U.S. takeover. England did not want war with the United States, and Sloat knew this. Now, there's a tale that Sloat outfoxed and outraced the English to Monterey. And that's not only a myth, it's very illogical. As historian H. H. Bancroft points out, the English could have raised the flag whenever they wanted. They did not need to watch Sloat and then race Sloat to Monterey. Also, the Cyan or the Portsmouth could have raised the U.S. flag at several opportunities. As far as the delay in Monterey, he knew from the time he sailed into Monterey that there were no Mexican forces nearby. He had plenty of time to assess any threat, build fortifications, and deploy his men and ships. He sent men out to search for Fremont to link forces. He had time to confer with Larkin, who had input with the proclamation. He's ready to make a decision of significant political and historical importance. What's the hurry? So Sloat's legacy. I think he successfully carried out his orders. He captured the capital and all of Mexican California with very little resistance. He also made all the inhabitants American citizens. Manifest Destiny became a reality in 1850 when California became a state, the first to be admitted not contiguous to another state. Thank you, Commodore Sloat. He made it look easy. Maybe if there had been a battle. There is a monument to Sloat and Sloat's Landing, commemorates the 50th anniversary in 1896. The cornerstone of the monument was laid in 1896 but the monument itself was not completed until 1910, almost 25 years of construction. And the monument sits today on the lower Presidio Hill, pretty much as forgotten as Sloat himself. So in conclusion, I think we should honor Sloat for what he achieved. If he had arrived a week or two earlier, what would have changed? Sloat's landing is probably the most forgotten significant event in American history, the capture of 600,000 square miles, all are part of seven future states. So thank you, Carmel Foundation, for remembering and celebrating Sloat and Sloat's Landing on the 175th anniversary. Thank you for inviting me to be a part, and thank you for watching.